Okay, thanks everyone uh, for joining. Man, four o'clock on, on the first day of the conference. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, I appreciate everyone joining, uh, and we're going to spend a few minutes here talking about probably a topic that um, is novel to most of you, uh, but you may be intrigued by what it is that we're seeing uh, in our business uh, and with some of the larger employers across the country. So uh, today uh, I want to talk, uh, believe it or not, about a movement. Um, it's a movement that I see kind of happening across corporate America. Everything from your 100 person cleaning franchise all the way to Walmart. Uh, it's a movement that's occurring today in large part because of a lot of the macro and microeconomic pressures that companies are under today. Uh, it's a movement that I believe represents a bit of an inevitable and inexorable change in the way that our employees consume their pay and what actually drives their experience at work. Our company, Daily Pay, was actually born out of this movement. Um, I'm Jason, and I'm on the, uh, clearly on the left-hand side of this slide. I'm excited to uh, share the stage here with Mr. Andrew Lauder, who is the Director of Human Resources for 21C Hotels, uh, who's also one of our partners uh, and someone who uses our service. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about uh, today's labor market um, and the market that we're in today and why it is that the largest American companies have joined this daily pay movement. Companies are now offering instant access to their earned wages as a recruitment, retention, and engagement tool for employees. So in the next 30 minutes or so, uh, this is what we're going to talk about. We'll talk a little bit about um, what recruiting and retention strategies companies are using today, but more importantly, kind of what are the market forces that are actually changing payroll and how payroll in the form of daily pay is actually becoming sort of the next new benefit. I'll address, of course, what is a daily pay benefit the ROI of such programs. And to wrap it up, I'll bring up who we are probably all really here to hear from, uh, who is Andy, and he can tell a little bit about his experience in rolling out this program to all of his different locations. Now, um, before we start, and for the latecomers coming in, uh, perfect timing, you're here for the contest portion of it. So before we start, um, uh, many of you may or maybe not have heard of 21C Museum and Hotels. Uh, that's where Andy is from and, and is the director of HR. Um, but 21C Hotels, basically a multi-venue kind of contemporary art museum that's coupled with a boutique hotel um, and some pretty interesting chef experiences. If you haven't been to one already, you should. Uh, go see one for yourself. And if you're local to this area, uh, there is one that's opening up here uh, near the Magnificent Mile. So. We're going to ask a quick trivia question before I flash it. Uh, this is not a team exercise. This is an individual competition. So do not look to your neighbor um, because there's only one winner the way really all contests should be run. And the contest winner will receive a gift card for a two-night stay at the 21C Museum Hotel of their choice, okay, based on where, based on where you live. So uh, the contest is... Interesting. The contest is who in this room can name four types of sausage? Just raise your hand. Four okay, in the green, right here. Okay. Robert. Yes. And Dewey. And Dewey. Okay, that is it. That is excellent. Four. Okay, so you are the winner of this contest. So you'll see Jamie afterwards and right over here, and she'll hook you up with uh, the gift card. So um, believe it or not, this actually does have something to do with our topic today. So uh, and it actually has something to do that's going on in Germany, um, which actually is resembling what's going on here in the United States. So today in Germany, the competition for qualified workers has become a bit of an existential issue for employers. Companies are actually offering enticements like overseas tourist trips, to the Empire State Building, uh, ski outings in the Swiss Alps, and of course, you guessed it, 
platters and platters of local sausage from Germany. And that's how people are attracting workers in Germany today. Now, most of us would agree that our employers aren't yet quite at the stage of being able to offer to pay for someone's vacation, or for that matter, even pay for a platter of bratwurst. Uh, but what we can do is offer our employees something they actually really want uh, and something that actually will last with them, which is core financial wellness and the tools that they need to actually advance in their personal lives. We're experiencing, and I think all of you who are touching or are around rewards or HR, I think we're, we're all sort of in this together, which is we're experiencing an incredibly tight labor market, which is forcing employers to really up their benefits game, to recruit the talent they want and to retain the talent that they already have. For younger folks in the workforce, and I unfortunately just had this conversation with many of you here today, I personally am sick of talking about millennials and Gen Z, especially that I'm a little bit older than that generation, but it is a reality that we are all facing, and they clearly want different things. There's student loan assistance, mentoring and career and development programs. Um, every study in the world is basically showing that these are the things that millennials and Gen Z want as they seek out mentorship um, opportunities and, frankly, companies where they can actually grow into leadership roles. There's the phenomenon of health and wellness perks, ranging anywhere from subsidized gym memberships uh, to sleep pods. But I think not all of us are in that position to be able to offer those perks, or frankly, it may not even be an appropriate thing to offer at some of our workplaces. There is, of course, the more blunt approach, uh, which is just increasing wages and paying people more. I find the irony very rich that as we're here talking about this topic here in this room, right upstairs, Amazon is having a major recruiting event for distribution center employees and for their warehouse workers and drivers. Uh, you, you know, you couldn't plan, you know, we, we did not do that. You could not plan this any better. Of course, Amazon recently announced that they have raised their wage amount to $15 an hour. Now, lastly, there is a new benefit which we'll talk about today called a daily pay benefit. It's a benefit that large employers are starting to adopt in order to stay competitive and to recruit and retain uh, employees at either a fraction or in many cases at zero cost relative to other traditional benefits. Now, before I dive into what is a daily pay benefit and how companies are using it to drive their business forward, I do want to talk about how it is that we got to this place to begin with. You know, why is it that we are here today and what's sort of leading to this environment, which is making it very natural for there to be this type of benefit that's growing. You know, oftentimes innovation really comes from market forces, environments changing. It sort of creates this petri dish of activity where things start to emerge. And I think we're in one of those times today. If you look at these things on the screen, none of these market forces have anything to do with employee retention and engagement in isolation. But when you sort of combine all of them together, it's creating a bit of a once in a lifetime moment where fundamentally payroll is changing and becoming a way to actually offer a benefit outside of just the core pay to employees to be able to attract and retain them. So let's get started. This section I'm going to kind of go through very quickly. Why is it that the environment is so robust for this type of benefit to be coming to emerge, rather? And the first, of course, is the difficulty that we're all having in hiring and retaining really good quality employees. Now, of course, um, I don't need to tell anyone in HR or in operations uh, that it's incredibly hard to hire people today, especially considering that we are in the tightest labor market that we've had in years, specifically since 1973. Unemployment rate, of course, is now at 3.7%, and the percent of open positions is right around 6.5%. About half of employers are currently reporting that they have jobs to fill. You may be among that half. And yet, under half of employees are saying that they'll likely leave their current job. And I suspect some of you probably have some of those folks in your workforce today. Now, normally, 
in normal environments, low employment, low unemployment rather, has a very easy solution, which is simply to pay people more. And it's really basic supply and demand. But today, that's actually not happening. Since the recession, inflation in the United States has remained largely flat, while wages have actually also remained flat. And that's normally not what you're supposed to see. In general, if you're trying to recruit and retain more people, in general, there should be wage inflation. And frankly, Amazon is the first to actually do that, and they're sort of leading the way in that. But in large part, none of us have actually seen that. You know, the paradox of the Trump economy, frankly, is that um, we're actually in one of the tightest labor markets that we've seen in decades, but there still is stubbornly low inflation growth. Wage growth has stagnated and grown less than even the dismal rate of inflation that we've seen. For example, in the last two years, we've seen median wages increase by 1.5%, which is less than 1.8% increase in core inflation. So besides this being uh, an economics class at 4 o'clock at a conference, what does this all sort of culminate in? It all culminates in it's really darn hard to actually go find and recruit people when all of us are sort of dealing with, well, the labor shortage, but yet we can't raise prices on our product because there's no inflation in the market and margin pressure continues to grow. And so that's kind of the paradox that we're sort of in. And so when you have that type of environment, it creates the need for change. And that's frankly the first market force that we're seeing is that the difficulty in the hiring market results in a need to attract people with the frequency of pay. The next market force that I'm sure all of you are very acutely aware of if you touch HR or for that matter even payroll or finance, um, it's the growing financial insecurity epidemic that we have in the United States today. Financial insecurity really does result from two causes. Uh, first, of course, it's a lack of savings, uh, and second, it's a lack of core earnings. According to a recent study by Bankrate, 34% of Americans do not have a single dollar saved, and 35% have less than $1,000 saved. That means a combined 69% of our workforce cannot afford an unexpected expense. I, I took out a slide that I normally do for this presentation because I think all of us would be a little guilty of this given what's going on right now. But there's a, st there's a statistic where um, the Pew Institute went out and surveyed what do people think is going to lead to their retirement, and 21%, one out of five people said the lottery. is They believe the lottery is what will lead to their retirement. Now, all of us are playing. Well, I know we're all playing the lottery today, which is why I took out that slide uh, for this presentation. But one in five Americans believe that that is how they will retire. And so there is massive, profound financial insecurity, and for that matter, education issues that we're having amongst our workforce. I'll tell you, as a technology CEO, I will be the first to tell you that technology also makes it really hard for people to save. Uh, convenience really does command a premium and we're starting to see that in our employee base. You know, you look at the average cost of public transportation in the United States, that's still $2. In New York, it's about $2.75. The minimum, not average, but the minimum one has to pay for an Uber is actually $5.60. And all of our younger workforce believe that that is, in fact, the way to travel. Even uh, technology around payments, again, some, a business that we touch does make it harder uh, or, frankly, easier to spend. When you think about credit cards, Apple Pay, all the way to in-app purchases, consumers don't have to reach into their pocket to actually pay anymore for goods or services. You know, the act that I'm sure all of us are familiar with, which is kind of reaching into our pockets, forking over the money, that used to make it more difficult for us to spend that environment has fundamentally changed, and so with that, there becomes a fundamental lack of savings amongst the workforce. Not surprising that this inability to save, it impacts lower income workers or hourly workers the hardest. About 72% of the bottom two buckets 
have less than $1,000 in savings. And when you add to that the challenges to save at all, you can see why it is that our workforce has so much trouble with trying to manage their financial security. But you know, I might posit or ask at this point, kind of so what? You know, does it really matter if the workforce is having trouble saving? And the answer is a resounding yes, it does matter, because the places and the opportunities that hit us as employers is when that storm actually hits. And so I think all of us who kind of work with hourly workers or minimum wage workers sort of understand that folks kind of have issues that will crop up and consequently that adds to an incredible amount of business disruption, um, not only for the folks who are not there, but of course as that pain spreads across the actual organization. Um, the Aspen Institute, which is a financial uh, wellness think tank, did a very quick study and what they figured out was that four in 10 families have made an extraordinary payment of at least $1,500 in the last 12 months. Now again, combine that with the lack of savings and the inability to withstand expenses, you can see why this is so disruptive for the actual employee and why it is that the employee is distracted at work or why she can't come to work on a particular day. It's because it fundamentally is disrupting their life. More interestingly, um, there's, uh, what they also concluded rather was that 37% or about a third of those surveys surveyed said they actually endured at least one or more of these types of major expenses in the same time frame. And so when you, when you kind of cut through this, the second market factor that's sort of leading to this kind of change that we're seeing is the fact that our employees are suffering from a profound degree of financial insecurity. And so all of a sudden you start to see the relevance of providing a way for them to instantly access, again, their earned wages to be able to withstand some of this volatility that they're experiencing. The next market force um, is just something that I spend a lot of time on, which is instant payments. Um, you know, the payment technology landscape has actually changed a lot in the last few years. Most of us here in this room are probably familiar with Next Business Day ACH. For those of you who don't deal with payments all day long, um, there's been some developments where now one can same day ACH, there are pay cards, and then finally uh, there's instant payments. We've built some technology which allows us to remit funds literally instantly, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now that may sound familiar to you, and it certainly sounds familiar to our employees. If you aren't familiar already with apps like Venmo or Zelle, these are peer-to-peer -peer payment apps. You may be using these maybe with um, your peers or with your kids. Um, but long story short, about 100 million people last year sent about $100 billion to each other instantly through these apps. Now, the majority of those users are millennials and Gen Z. But there's also clear adoption across all generations of these types of products. Now I'm getting to my point, which is when surveyed, most were using instant payments as a matter of convenience. And here's kind of the reaction that people felt when they made an instant payment. And I think the most interesting statistic on this slide is the second from the left, which is, when people were asked, how did you feel when you were able to zap a payment to someone instantly? The answer for almost four out of 10 people was, I feel normal. Meaning, right now, the way that millennials and Gen Z see money transfer is that this is the world, or this is rather the way the world should work. The world should work instantly. We should be able to. It's normal to be able to zap money back and forth to each other. So tell me again, why am I waiting for batch payroll? I can order a car instantly, a hot meal instantly. I can get a dog walker instantly. And you're telling me I have to wait for a two week payday when I can send my friend money instantly right now. 
And so the nuances of, well, there's this thing called ACH and the banking network and people don't work on the weekend, that, I think that's foreign to this generation of workers. And so it's created an expectation that money ought to be able to be transferred instantly on demand. And so um, the third market factor, uh, which is sort of changing people's perception about the way payroll should be used in the benefits context, is they see instant pay in every other context of their life. Well, that ought to be able to be applied by the most fundamental of all money transfer, which is payroll. Fourth, uh, we talked about millennials and Gen Z. I'm going to skip through some of these slides. Based on my surveying of the folks here, I think everyone's sick of hearing about um, how the workforce is dynamically changing. Um, so let me kind of race through some of this. I think everyone knows that, you know, for better or for worse, th they will make up three-fourths of the workforce very, very soon. And whilst every generation has their own uh, considerations and has their own unique um, attributes, I think we all can agree in this room that, that millennials and Gen Z are, in fact, very unique, whether it's related to the fact that they are digital natives, um, that they've now grown up in an age of enablement through technology. Um, when, you, um, you know, when, you, when you look at the things that they're asking for, whether it be flexibility around work, including hours, and the perception that that will make someone more productive, um, please note the chagrin in my own, and my sh the chagrin in my own voice as, I, as, we, as we look at this, and, or the fact that folks will be willing to take less pay in exchange for more hours, we can all agree it's a very unique work um, population, probably one that we're not as familiar with as operators. I think, though, this sums it up when you think about the needs that this workforce has. Younger generations become frustrated quickly when companies fail to address simple problems with obvious technical solutions. I would venture to say that obvious technical solutions could be the fact that one uses Venmo or Zelle every single minute during the day. That feels very obvious to someone. Simple problems, what, I don't understand. Why can't one just run payroll daily? Why can't, I already worked for, I worked today, well, why can't I get the money today? You know, I, I have a pressing need. I have rent. I have to pay for diapers. You know, I'm about to be evicted, and I know I already worked this week. And so these are very simple issues that create an enormous level of dissonance for this generation when they see how they can operate in every other portion of their life. And so millennials and Gen Z and the expectations that they have is certainly also leading to this change. The fifth and final area that I want to address has really nothing to do with anything we're talking about here today, except for the fact that it's created a very interesting model that our employees look at and wonder why it's not happening here. And that's the gig economy. If you don't know about the gig economy, in 1989, freelancers made up about 6% of the workforce. By 2017, excuse me, in 2017, it was 34, and in a few years, almost half of the population will be some type of freelance worker. A lot of these employees work for these companies like Uber. And when you poll those employees or those on-demand workers, 81% have said, hey, now that I've tried it once, I've kind of taken a few rides, I've driven a few people. Eight out of 10 folks say, I will probably up my hours. You know, I like this flexibility. I like what um, companies like Uber have to offer. Now, Jamie. The interesting thing about the gig economy, which you may or may not be aware of, is it is the first whole scale industry to fully convert to an instant payment payroll. Every single driver who delivers groceries on Instacart, who drove you from the airport here to this hotel in an Uber, delivered your dinner through Grubhub, all of those drivers 
can or will about to or will be about to can cash out of their ride that instant they close it out. So that Uber driver who took me here pressed a button when he dropped me off, and as he's driving off back to the airport, that money already showed up in her bank account. And what's notable about this is that many of our employees are already moonlighting as these drivers. Many of our employees already know about this. They are bombarded constantly with ads, recruitment, recruitment postings, all sorts of things that tell them, why would you ever want to work for a traditional company where you can basically control how it is that you get paid? These companies are not going away. They will only get larger. When you think about Uber, who now has over a million drivers in the United States, if you think about how long it takes to recruit a million people to your company, some of us must have trouble recruiting 10 people or filling 50 open positions. Uber's recruited a million people. And one of the ways in which it's done that, it's a very well-known thing that they advertise, you know, the, the, the days of getting paid once every two weeks are behind us. You come work for Uber and you get paid today. And therefore, and, and it's not just about being discretionary with those funds, it's so they can work more. The fundamental premise of an Uber driver is he uses his own car, pays for his own gas to then create earnings for herself. Well, now that she has money coming in, that means she can fill the tank more often, pay for the flat tire, get back on the road quicker, and create this cycle of being able to earn more for herself. And that's really the value proposition that companies like Uber have sold to, the, to um, these types of employees and workers. So the gig economy, um, while it may seem unrelated to what we're discussing here, it frankly provides a very fascinating paragon of what the world could look like. And I think a lot of our employees may already be moonlighting as employees of those companies. So these are kind of the five factors. Why did I kind of go through all of this? Really to provide the background and the foundation for all of us to understand this is not something that we just kind of made up because we thought it had to be made up. There are these sort of five factors that are conspiring in the environment to create modus for change. And that's kind of why it is that this has sort of led to what we call the daily pay movement. So I'm going to talk about what this actually is, which is probably why you've come um, and why you've sat through that background. I'm going to walk through a little bit of kind of what it is, um, how does it work for a few minutes, and then again, bring up Andy to talk about his personal experience with it. So uh, the daily pay benefit um, is one that does allow your employees and our employees to access their earned wages, only earned wages, on their own schedule, presumably if, it, if they need it prior to payday. Um, it's typically used, about 94% of the time, typically used to pay for bills uh, and to avoid late fees. You know, the classic situation is you know, we've got an employee She's worked all week. It's Friday night. Payday's not until next Friday. She's already earned her week's worth of pay, but rent is due tomorrow. And what typically would happen, and it probably we've all been there in college or maybe even afterwards, where if you don't have the money to pay your rent, there's really only one thing you can do, which is hide from the landlord and just pay the rent late. And when you do that, you pay a $35 late fee or, who, or whatever the fee might be that's charged by the landlord. Oftentimes, our employees don't have zero in the bank account. It's very rare that someone has zero. Usually, you have just not enough to make the rent payment. $300 rent payment, and I've got $220 of the $300. And so what often occurs is that the employee is paying a $35 late fee because she's short $80. And so that's the problem that we felt was unacceptable the other sort of way to address that issue, of course, is to intentionally write the bad check. And if you write a bad check, maybe the bank will cover you through overdraft, but still, you'll be charged $30 this time by the overdraft from the bank. I think we've all probably done that <clears throat> at some point as well, which is just writing a bad check, knowing the bank will cover it. So the concept, again, is I'm short $80. I've already worked. There has to be a better way to use technology and to use funding markets 
to be able to capture that $80 deficit and not pay $30, $35 just because I'm short 80. And that's really where the benefit sort of arose. If um, we created the benefit in 2015, and uh, you can imagine that um, it's been sort of a whirlwind since then, you know, payroll itself uh, has not changed in over two centuries. And so to be able to sort of introduce this as a way to fundamentally alter pay and to have pay kind of go back to its original roots as the original benefit. But now, sort of changing the frequency of that as a way to, uh, to use it as a retention or recruitment tool. From the employer standpoint, I do want to uh, uh, sort of describe what this actually is. And um, to give you some sense, offering employees daily pay is not something, frankly, that you need any vendor to do. Right? That is actually something you yourself can do on your own. The concept here is offering that flexibility to the employee. That's what creates the employee change. It has nothing to do with us or some of the others in the marketplace who offer this benefit. It really has very little to do with us. It's the concept of being able to offer it. And frankly, all of you can have your companies do this without anything from us. If you think about running payroll daily, what it would mean is that every employee would receive 100% of her net pay daily. The problem is, Companies aren't set up to do the rest of it, which is, well, that means that the company now has to create change management around funding payroll every day. There are tax withholding requirements if the company really were to pay payroll every day, dealing with deductions every day, and then finally having all of the employee hours approved every single day. And so again, this is the concept which is, in theory, there is nothing impossible about doing this as an employer. The challenge is everything in red. That's where it becomes hard. And that's frankly where we step in, which is, hey, let's figure out a way through technology to provide all your employees 100% of their net pay, to do it instantly every single day, but without all of the bad stuff, without changing your payroll funds, without changing the timing of your withholdings, without changing the deductions, without changing HR and or payroll, cleaning up everyone's missed punches. We don't require any change to the payroll system or payroll timing of funds. In fact, nothing changes. And that's really the value and the magic of what it is that these types of benefits offered through this type of technology platform can provide. We like to say it's all the good stuff without any of the bad stuff. Um, we're going to pause here and maybe give you a little bit of a sense. You're probably sick of hearing me talk about this, but have a listen to um, uh, one of our partners, Dial America, uh, which is uh, a 3,000 person contact center uh, across the country. They offered, they, we're going to hear from Andy in a little bit, but they made us a, a short video that I want you to listen to because I want you to hear the employee perspective and what it actually does for the end employee. Hi, my name is Mitchell and I work for Dial America and I've been here for about two years now. Hi, my name is Tamika. I am an agent here at Dial America in Mawa, New Jersey and I've been working here for about roughly eight months. I started using Daily Pay because I knew I would have access to my funds before my payday. So I signed up for Daily Pay and my mom's birthday was Friday and I actually didn't get paid until the following Tuesday. My mom really needed a phone that was only $60 short and um, that's when I thought of using the Daily Pay. One day, my son, he's asthmatic. I got a call that he didn't have any more medicine at school. My son needs that medicine to breathe, but I didn't have the money to get the medicine. I used the daily pay. I logged in, selected the amount, and then 
you know, selected the debit card that I wanted it to go to. I did an instant payment and I was able to get my son his medicine. It's instantaneous, very easy. Right after that, you know, I was like, hey mom, you know, let's go ahead and get this phone. She burst it into tears, she hugged me. It has come in handy, you know, either when I need a gas or either when I need to get that gift for my mom. We all do not have a support system, so just to be able to get money, you know, before your paycheck is wonderful. But I got the medicine, it worked, and I just want to thank Daily Pay so much because without that, my baby really could have you know, not been here with me. I really appreciate it a lot that Dial America has partnered with Daily Pay. One of the um, reasons why I love that video is because, you know, never before has there really been a way that an employee can have all of her needs met through one single channel. And in this case, that's really the employer. And so it's not surprising that this deepens the bond between the employer and the employee. You know, when someone really can have their needs met in an emergency or in a crisis, if you think about a friend who is there for you in that crisis, that's essentially what we've created with the employee vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the employee, uh, the employer rather, vis-a-vis -vis the employee and it's not surprising to me why employees just stay longer. It's really hard to leave a job where you're having your needs met financially and through these types of situations. And so that's kind of why it is that we're seeing performance radically change at the company level. Um, just a little bit just on how it works, and then I want to talk about the employer's perspective. Um, the product is just like an ATM machine. Basically, you know, it, it shows how much you earned, um, and you know, we do some magic behind the scenes, which is not really relevant for this discussion, uh, but it works just like an ATM machine. Employees basically request what they need. Um, it gets transferred instantly into their bank account or to their pay card. Most importantly, unlike a payday loan or unlike any other type of loan, there's nothing ever to pay back because it is her money. She's already earned it. It would be as if you took out money from an ATM machine on the corner, and then a week from now, you try to put that money back in the machine to pay the machine back. You don't do that. That's not what we do, because it's already your money. And so in the same way, the dynamic for the employee is she transfers what she needs, and then we are paid back through the payroll process because she's already earned that money. It already is hers. And so by definition, there's no loan that we create vis-a-vis -vis the employee. Every, can you go back? every time the employee takes a transfer, she's peppered with financial wellness tips um, um, and encourages her to be budgeting and saving along the way. In terms of usage, um, the way that uh, you can kind of see that folks will use it all the way up to six figures. About 12% of our users make north of six figures. But the preponderance is probably between that twenty to fifty thousand dollar range. In addition, in terms of usage, one hundred percent of employees will receive something on payday. Meaning, I, I think I shared this with someone else. No one's out going there. You know, no one's out buying flat screen TVs. You know, we haven't we haven't created great business for Best Buy. They're not out there buying flat screen TVs. This is real life. This is asthma medicine. You know, this is uh, something sentimental that someone wants to purchase for their mother. This is, re this is rent. This is real life. And, um, and it's not sort of kind of running around with discretionary spending. Only 6% of our employees actually even will transfer more than half of their paycheck. And frankly, that 6% changes every single week. So no different than health care insurance. In health care, none of us really use our health care insurance every week. Um, typically, we use it sporadically upon emergencies, and that's really how folks will use our product. Uh, I think we have some stats that we surveyed. Um, these are our generic ones, but I think we have some of the numbers that Andy and I will share about what's going on in his live use case, but it's remarkable. Basically, folks have said 80 to 90% of the time I'm using it to pay bills back, avoid late fees. 100% of the employees now recommend their friends to come work for the employer as a result of daily pay. So there's real change that we're creating at the employer level. Again, um, Andy's obviously outperforming relative to, oh, 
relative to the averages, our average is that 87% of employees uh, will now recommend their employer to a friend, and you can kind of see the change in their perspective has increased significantly. The numbers of fours and fives in terms of how much the opinion has changed is remarkable. Um, again, for employers, there's no change to the payroll process, no change in funding, no fees or implementation cost. We charge an ATM-like fee to the employee, and it's compliant in all 50 states. From a company perspective, about 30%, 30 to 40% of the company will typically use the program. Um, that's sort of expected given the income distribution that you all probably have. And they use it for about once a week for about $66. As I said, 94% of uh, folks self-report that they're using it to pay bills. The results on average, 41% reduction in turnover for daily pay users. I don't know of any other benefit that creates that type of tangible result. We measure that. We calculate it because it's very easy for us to calculate who's using it, who's not, and how long they're staying. It's remarkable. The employee who would have quit in three months, she now stays for five. The employee who would have quit for six months, she now stays for nine months. And that's a remarkable cost savings when you think about that dropping to the bottom line in terms of margin. 73% say they're more motivated to come to work. And for those who are in HR and whose responsibility it is to fill jobs, we ask and we advise our partners, advertise. Advertise this on your job postings, and you'll see the difference. 52% increase in applicants simply by adding the word daily pay option on that long list of bullets that you have that talk about the benefits for coming working at your company. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just uh, uh, about ROI. Uh, sorry, I'm going to skip rather over this piece of it. Um, this was kind of the the uh, the calculations that we provide companies. I'm not going to go through all this math, but what I will get to is the fact that um, we do do this on behalf of anyone who is interested. Um, we can kind of run this report for you guys um, so you can kind of see what the ROI uh, would be. And with that, Andy, I'd love to invite you up and maybe kind of do a brief Q&A with you um, about your experiences with uh, offering the program. Sure. And do you want to sit or do you want to stand? Uh, how about I just lean up against okay. this guy? <laughs> okay, so um, I think everyone um, has been waiting patiently for, um, for this part of it. So uh, I'm thrilled that Andy has kind of joined us here. Andy, uh, as I said, was, is director of HR at 21C uh, Museum and Hotels. And you know, 21C has got a very unique mix of employees. Um, like a lot of you in the audience, uh, you've got some folks in the field, uh, and you've got some folks obviously in corporate or sort of at the, at the home office, I would say. Sure. Um, and Andrew kind of brought on daily pay as a benefit for really all of the employees. So um, Andy, let me, let me start with just, you know, give us some of your background. How did you get into HR, all of that? Sure. So uh, thanks, Jason. Um, I actually started in HR on accident. Um, I was right out of school, and uh, I actually started doing IT and engineering recruiting. Fast forward a little later, I actually ended up working in HR for Amazon in a couple of their fulfillment centers. I then moved on to their corporate office in Seattle in a risk management role. And uh, fast forward, I ended up doing some workforce development for uh, the city of Cincinnati in Hamilton County, and I've been with... Uh, I've been with 21C almost six years now. Okay, and Andy, over those six years, have you been able to define, I guess, today, what are the strategic priorities from an HR standpoint today? Yeah, so, so I can tell you that, that things have changed um, over the last several years. Um, so for us, um, our priority is to continue to add value to our benefits and what we consider our already rich benefits but also we want to have a great experience for our team and our teammates. We want them to enjoy being where they're at. And so that work never stops and we're always continuing to do that while at the same time, 
at the same time trying to be competitive against other other companies within our own industry as well as those other emergency emerging industries such as Amazon and warehousing that's really just taking a very already shallow pool of people and making it even smaller. Now Andy, I didn't bring your soapbox, but any any I mean we but I think someone flashed up here this uh, this ad here about Amazon raising wages. How is that impacting your business just given your locations and and what are you doing about it? So for the record, I started talking about this about a year and a half ago <laughs> because their wages were already 2 to 3 dollars higher than what ours were in the hospitality area for essentially the same person, same skill set. Um, so what we're continuing to do is just to look at whatever we can bring on that gives us an edge and what keeps us competitive out there uh, that makes us look a little bit more attractive. And what prompted you, Andy, to look at daily pay? I mean, there's a lot of stuff you could have done um, and that you are doing. So what prompted you to, to look at daily pay as an option. Sure, so I was complete, completely oblivious to the idea of folks being able to have access to earn but unpaid wages. And then one morning I received an email about this and I thought, wow, this could be what really turns the tide for us in regards to recruitment. Um, and, and so after a little bit of looking around, um, it was clear to see that this was really something that could work for us. And so now we've definitely included it into our benefit guide, uh, just right along with medical, dental, vision, and all of those other benefits that we offer. So Andy, um, I think we have the math somewhere here, but basically the turnover, Andy, for your group has been cut relative to your pre-daily pay or comparing it to non-daily pay users by about a third. Um, and so that's probably a meaningful cost savings for 21C to cut a third, 33% reduction in the turnover rate, um, you know, it's just remarkable. I don't know if you want to share it, on that. I mean, that's a huge number, and let me just say that any reduction is is welcome. <laughs> um, but but I mean, that number in particular is just a, a huge amount, and that is actually without us really not doing anything except making it available. We don't constantly ask folks if they've uh, used daily pay in a very similar way that we wouldn't ask them if they've recently been to the doctor. So uh, we haven't scratched the surface on really selling that. We don't use it yet as part of our recruiting um, literature and things like that. So there are tons of options and with those results already, who knows what will happen. So Andy, I wanna kind of walk people through this data here and I'm actually gonna read some of these. Um, so we polled in connection with 21C, the actual employee base. The left-hand side in green are numbers relative to how people are using the program. The right-hand side in blue are the results. And the why, why we've juxtaposed these is to so you can see the connection. Daily pay has helped me pay bills on time, 86% of respondents said that's why they're using it, which is why it's not surprising that 71% say that their opinion of the company has actually improved since offering it. I pay fewer late fees because of daily pay. A third of the population is saying that, which is why 100% of the folks are saying, well, now I'd actually recommend that people come and work at this company. So that's kind of the connection that folks are seeing Andy, give us, you know, I, we laughed about this before. Give me a little bit of the sense of how no news is good news. I mean, kind well, of like, because I think a lot of folks here are, wor are wondering about that implementation. And, yeah, and so, so for those of you that work closely with benefits, um, you never hear about it when it's working well, right? Mm -hmm. And so we don't hear a lot. We don't get a lot of feedback in regards to daily pay. In fact, I have, I have asked consistently as I'm walking through our properties, for some feedback and, and it just isn't there. And so with my HR hat on, I wear it proudly that no news is good news because that means it's working. We can totally see that it's being utilized. And let me just say, just to point out this piece about recommending 21C, I mean, for those of you that conduct annual teammate surveys, that's the question you want answered, right? 
And for 100% of those folks that have used daily pay to be able to answer that question. Yeah, one thing we say is we don't care about our NPS. We care about your NPS. That's really what we care about is improving your ENPS, not ours. Um, so I think that's kind of what we see here in spades. Andy, thank you for sharing your experience. I think thank you all. Um, they're trying to uh, get us out of here. But, um, but we're around for questions uh, after the sesh. And again, thanks so much for your time. If you want to learn more, we've got that. Um, whoever won the sausage contest, get, come get your gift, your gift card. Um, but we'll, we're open for any questions afterwards. Yep. We have 10 minutes? Yeah. We actually have eight minutes for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know. Go ahead. Yeah. So for our integration process, it was fairly seamless. And when I say seamless, I mean daily pay did all of the hard, heavy lifting. Uh, we use ADP, uh, which for any of you that may be uh, familiar with ADP, it sometimes is very uh, non-movable and, and is difficult to use. Uh, but these guys did all of the, the work in making that happen. So it was fairly easy. Uh, of course, we chose to pilot it at one of our locations instead of just rolling it out to all. Um, but uh, after several months of that pilot, we were, we were good to go. There's no change to the payroll system. We, the, this, our thing kind of fits in between the, whatever payroll system you have today. So this is a bit of a, a longer question, but it, um, the short answer is you actually don't have to change anything about the payroll process. All of that deduction stuff happens behind the scenes without the company's involvement. Um, but we can certainly walk you through those precise mechanics. Yes. Sure. Yep. So again, I think we referenced it. We charge only, there's only one fee ever, 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 ever. Only one fee ever, ever and that is a transaction fee. It is no different than the ATM machine that's in the lobby of this hotel. If you don't use it, you don't pay a fee. If you need $100, you'll pay whatever their $3 fee is. There's a $2.99 fee that we charge. It can be employer or employee paid. 93% of companies have the employees just pay it. So they view it like an ATM machine. I brought this ATM machine and installed it at my office for your convenience. That's my part. And if the employees want to use it, great. If they don't need it, no problem. Is this US only or is this also in other countries? So currently we only offer this in the US. Our next country obviously is Canada. Um, and so, um, but right now it's, it's only in the US. Okay, anything else? Great, well we'll be around. Um, again, Jason, Thank you, Andy, Jamie, for your help, and I appreciate it, guys.